glasses, paper, nope, wrong paper. One second. Um, welcome to the 2012 New Yorker Festival. Uh, I'm Judith Thurman, and um, I'm really nervous, and so is Alison Bechtel, really nervous. But I'm also really uh, thrilled to have her as, as my guest, as our guest, for this conversation. Um, a few uh, public service announcements of the fast, and here's how you do your seatbelt variety. If this will, this, our conversation will last about 75 minutes, and then there'll be question Q&A after that. Um, you will feel inhibited for 30 seconds, and then you will all line up in droves uh, at the mics in the aisle. Uh, there uh, is, f photography is not permissible. It's not, it's not, uh, can't take pictures. And if you are planning on putting a video camera on the seat, don't bother. Allison believes 100% of Americans are entitled to their benefits. Um, you please also silence or indeed turn off your cell phones, especially uh, if you're expecting a phone call from your mother who wants to complain about her sciatica, which is um, a sort of an apropos subject, and um, you may indeed feel differently about her when we're done. Uh, <laughs> hate technology. Uh, for those of you who don't know Allison's books and do not have um, a mouse pad with one of her cartoons on them, uh, which is great shame, unlike the Met, they're not for sale in the lobby. Uh, she is the premier graphic memoirist um, of the country. She started her career, she was, she's the author of a, of a cartoon series, Dykes to Watch Out For, that ran for 25 years in over 50 alter alternative <laughs> newspapers. <laughs> Thank you. And it ended in 2008, but it's collected in one or several anthologies. One big anthology. One big anthology. Best of Dykes. It, uh, the Essential Dykes to Watch Out For. The Essential Dykes to Watch Out For. Uh, she is also the author of two graphic memoirs, Fun Home, which was published in 2006, and uh, her latest, um, Are You My Mother, which was published earlier this year in May. Uh, and Allison was the subject of a profile that I did for the magazine in, in April. Um, she turned 52 in August. Um, and You're not supposed to talk about people's ages. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, That's so, what my mother says. No, well, she, Allison's mother, Helen, will not. She wouldn't tell me her age. It's uh, 50 plus 20s. Um, so you've certainly made your life your subject in, in, in a much more intimate and um, in a way daring fashion than many memoirists. Uh, and that subject has also been your family and your very, in a way, primal relations with both parents. <laughs> Your father was the principal subject of Fun Home, and your mother, Helen, is the principal subject, but in a way the co-star of, um, of Are You My Mother? And The uh, co-star with? With? Someone asked me recently, who is the protagonist of this new book? And I didn't think it was my mother, and I didn't think it was me. I think it might be Donald Winnicott. He's this psychoanalyst who I... Yes, kind of adulate and write a lot about in this new book. So, well, there, wouldn't you say that, that there's sort of a, it seems to me there's kind of a, yeah, he, he, well, let's talk about it. Donald Winnicott was the British psychoanalyst who was, in fact, analyzed himself by James Strachey. He was a contemporary of Virginia Woolf, who's also, who's also appears, features in um, Are You My Mother? Yes. Do you want me to talk about Winnicott? Is that what you're saying? Um, well, I, first let's talk about Helen. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Helen I took us on track. I'm sorry about that. But, but I got confused by your question because I'm not sure if my mother and I are the co-stars of the book or not. Okay. You decide. You get, you're the, you get to decide that. So. But your mother is definitely at the, at the heart. You're, you're, yes. This book started as after you wrote about your father in Fun Home, you decided you would 
write about your mother in yes. the next memoir. Yes. Although it took me a very long time to realize that's what I was doing. I was actually trying to, <laughs> I realized I was avoiding writing about my mother for a very long time. At first, the, this second memoir was going to be about relationships and the self and the other. It was all very abstract until I realized I was avoiding the subject of the, of the true relationship, which was my relationship with my mother that I was kind of afraid to write about. And at that point, I realized, OK, you just have to do it. So then I focused more clearly on her. Mm -hmm. And what, uh, at, well, the, the self, I mean, the title of the book, Are You My Mother, comes from the children's book, uh, sort of classic children's book, in which a baby bird goes in search of its reflection because the mother has left the nest and he's hatched. She, she has hatched. Uh, and so it's the notion that a child gets a primary ref reflection from its mother. Right. Um, so would you, were you, did you, when you found the title, did you feel like the bird who had not, didn't have the reflection, you had to get it yourself? Uh, yes, yes, I did. Um, can I show some pictures? Yeah, let's, let's definitely show some pictures. This is going to be lavishly illustrated. Um, let's see if they actually go up. Um, wait. <laughs> Judith and I were both, like, battling. We're, we're, we're anxious because she has all these great questions written out, and I put the slides together, but we can't really count on either of our orders because this is supposed to be spontaneous, so we're both really right. nervous. We're nervous. We're also both complete control freaks. Yeah, yeah. Like, we're, see, I'm, I'm wrestling to show the pictures. Okay, go ahead. This is. <laughs> well, just on the subject of my mother, I thought we would look at some pictures of yeah. her. And this is like, this is my primal scene with my mother. This period in my childhood when I had obsessive compulsive disorder, and I, it took me forever to make my diary entries at night because I was like making these obscure little marks. So my mother took dictation from me for a while, uh, like this. Here's her, I, I started this entry and then she finished it with her nice, neat handwriting. And this was such a traumatic or pivotal moment for me that I had to write about. This, this, this scene happens in my book, Fun Home, the book about my dad, but I revisit it in the book about my mother. Here's that same page again, and here's my mother and me doing the diary. Um, and you're 10 at this point. I just turned 11. And, and just for a second, tell, tell us what the, 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 uh, the OCD manifested itself in, in writing. Because I think some people wash their hands and other people are afraid to go out. But this is a very particular. Yes, look, see, see that little funny sign over the W and we? I would do that. Or, or over the I. It was like this protective spell. I felt like I had to protect the people I was writing about. Uh, but you also felt that nothing you said was ever true. Yes, and that grew out of doubting what I was. <laughs> it's very complicated. Originally, these marks were, were the words, I think, indicating doubt. Like whatever I wrote down, I would write, I think, after. And then it turned into this squiggle. And then, then my mother had to step in and take, my, take dictation from me because it was taking so long. But I feel like this is the, the moment that I became not so much a writer, because I think that happened much earlier in my life, but a memoirist, like someone who really wanted to write about my own life, because this was my diary. I was getting this attention from my mother that I had always yearned for. And finally, I was getting it, but in this sort of attenuated form of her writing down my words. Because she, did, she was not attentive. It was very hard for you to get good attention from her yes. or recognition. Yes, she was pretty distant. Um, and did she ever she, did she ever censor or or correct anything you told her to write? No, she wrote down everything I said. It was a, it was amazing. Mm. Um. But she but but so but there were very few moments. Your your mother was uh, she had wanted to be an actress and she had studied acting and then she gave up her her career really when when uh, she had her children. Yes, here she is backstage. Um. She, yeah, she went, like, was an, did an internship at, at the Cleveland Playhouse and really wanted to be an actress, but then didn't do it. But she kept, she did summer stock all the time I was growing up. Um, 
here again is an image. This is, this is my mother in Fun Home, and I, this is the, the, another scene that gets repeated in the book about her. And, and you, you describe it, this is a beautiful passage about putting on her face, uh, and, you know, the, which is a mask, and, and there were a lot of masks in that household, right? Yes. She uh, didn't like me to watch her put on her everyday makeup. Um, but, yeah, she would not go out of the house without her makeup. I guess that's not so unusual. Lots no. of women do that. Um, um, but um, so the, 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 the moment of she, she was distant and your father was also kind of tyrannical, as you tell it, wonderful, precise detail, uh, sometimes wonderful, but mostly tyrannical and a man who lived with great secrets. Yes. Should I tell the secret? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the secret of our household was that my father was gay or bisexual, at least, and um, was having affairs with other men and, and his high school students, uh, which I didn't learn until after I came out to my parents when I was in college. So, and, and then that, that moment of revelation was followed very quickly by my father's death. He was hit by a truck and what we pretty much assume was Suicide. So you, you're at Oberlin. You write this very difficult letter to your family. You tell them that you've discovered that you're lesbian, and then what's their reaction? That well, it's kind of what the whole book is about. Um, you know, it's all very complicated. Uh, but their reaction was my my mother wouldn't talk to me. My father uh, was was strangely intimate with me and he was like, oh, well, that's cool. I'm glad you're having a good time. Like as if I were having an orgy or something, which I, I hadn't even had sex with anyone at that point. It was all um, very cerebral for me. But then a few weeks later, my mother talked to me on the phone and explained that this was bringing up something from her past. And then she told me about my dad and it was, I was just completely blown away because I thought I had this big, exciting, thing, you know, my, my own story. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm like a footnote in my parents' failed marriage. And then, of course, he uh, steals the show yet again. Yes, yet again, um, by dying. But your, so your father, who died when you were a teenager in his 40s, uh, he did not read um, Fun Home. He didn't, you had a, I don't know if you would say this, a kind of greater emotional freedom in relation to him than you did in relation to your mother writing, Are You My Mother? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's much easier to write about a dead person. Um, my mother was basically looking over my shoulder as I, as I wrote this more recent book about her, and that was really difficult. And Judith, you asked me when you were interviewing me for the profile, you, it was the very end, it was, might have been the last thing you asked me, is this book really honest, or is this book as honest as it could be? Remember when you yes. asked me that? Yes. And I hemmed and hawed and I said yes, but I keep, it's haunting me because I don't, I don't think it is. I think it was as honest as it could be with my mother looking over my shoulder. Mm -hmm. I would have written a different book if she were not going to read it. Mm -hmm. So I well, just wanted to set the record straight on that. Um, um, well, it's like, I think, and then it's, your, it, it's, <laughs> it's, the, it's, the, it's the, the search for the truth, which of course you can only approach, you don't actually get there. No, um, but there's in the search, sort of the search for the good, what Winnicott calls the good enough mother, the mother who gives you a reflection and who's not projecting her own reflection onto you, which to some degree both your parents did. Your father with his stuffing, he was, they were both English teachers and, and your father stuffing you with his, the books that he loved and his own ambitions and this, this pall of, of unrealized ambitions in the house. And so Winnicott, whom I also happened to love. How did you, f where were you when you first found, you were in a bookstore in somewhere like Minnesota when you found. Yeah, I first learned about Donald Winnicott when I was reading the drama of the gifted child. Does anyone know that book? That's <laughs> very, um, don't read it. It'll, it'll <laughs> ruin give it your to life. Your, <laughs> give it to your teenage children. Um, it's a book by Alice Miller about how parents, actually it's a book about psychoanalysts. Um, yes, but uh, I moved that. I oh, good. Okay. where it is now. These, are, are, just, these are just some images of my... My mother is a very minor figure in the book, 
about my dad <clears throat> in Fun Home. These are just some little. <coughs> but me. you see your age through the decades in both these books. I mean, it's sort of a record of. of in in Fun Home, she's pretty much in her like 30s and 40s. Um, here I am helping her rehearse for uh, her role as Lady Bracknell. And here she is as Lady Bracknell. And then in Are You My Mother, she, we see her in um, A Little Night Music. There she's Madame Armfelt. She had to sing a solo. That was very... Uh, she was a great pianist as well. She yes, she played the piano. Sometimes I think I became a cartoonist because it was the only creative turf that neither of my parents had any claim in. And you once said also your mother, both, they were both had very literary tastes and cartoons were like the ultrasonic ring on a teenager's phone. She just couldn't relate to them. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so the, these are just examples. We don't have to talk about these. Just no, my mother, is, as, here's my mother as a little girl. Here's my mother pregnant with me. The book about my mother is, in a lot of ways, about her. You know, in some ways, she did realize her artistic ambitions. She kept acting. Somehow, she managed to do that, which I think is kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. But she wanted to be a writer when she was young. I, she, here, she's writing some poetry. She studied poetry in college. Uh, and she's there. That's uh, that's Helen and your father. Um, they met at a. As yes, on, they met in um, the Taming of the Shrew. My mother was the lead, and my dad was one of the, just one of the guys. This is her wor working in New York City in the 50s, and here she is writing again. But she also typed up your father's papers, and so she took dictation for him as well. Kind of, yeah. She would help my dad with his um, graduate school English work. But she was really the one who should have been in grad school. He dropped out. And I think that was her true calling, was to, if she had been an academic, she would be much happier. But you also said something I thought which was wonderful, that, that um, you, you and your father were on opposite sides of Stonewall, and you and your mother were on, were on opposite sides of the women's liberation movement. And if they had been born later, they would have been much happier, but you wouldn't exist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see both of these books as kind of political histories in a way, you know of the difference between my life as a lesbian, my life as a woman, and my, my parents' lives. Um, certainly my father's life, you know, he was closeted, closeted and unhappy and making all of us unhappy. Um, and my mother, you know, I feel like she was is pretty heroic and, and managed to do a, so many things in her life, but never was the full-time artist that she yearned to be. And somehow they gave you the message that don't sacrifice your artistic ambitions for domestic life. Yeah, certainly not for children. Right. That feels good when you get that message. Um, so you were in a bookshop and you found... Oh yeah, uh, the drama of the gifted child and it referred to these very entrancing ideas uh, by someone named Winnicott, and there was no pronoun. I didn't. I assumed Winnicott was a woman because it was ideas about what happens between the mother and the baby, um, the way, especially this this notion of mirroring that the mother is, is a mirror for the baby. That what the baby sees in the mother's face is not the mother, but the baby themselves, unless the mother is distracted or depressed or crazy. Um, and then the baby only sees a face and not a reflection, and that is damaging. Anyhow, I found that very entrancing. Do we have the picture of you looking at your mother in here, or did we? Oh, uh, it's way at the end. Okay, never mind. <laughs> You'll see it. Wait for it. Um, so, so you started reading Winnicott, and he... I actually didn't start reading Winnicott himself till much later. Like, this was in my 20s when I first started seeing a therapist and re reading books about therapy. Um, and it wasn't until I began writing the memoir about my mother that I started reading Winnicott himself. And he, he's kind of difficult. I mean, he's, he's a psychoanalyst, and I, it's all very 
opaque, kind of jargony. Well, n for psychoanalysts, he's pretty lucid, but um, it was still rough sledding. Uh, and writing the book about my mother was actually a whole research project into Winnicott, reading his biography, reading his ideas, getting a sense of the arc of his ideas over his life. Um, and he, he was just had these amazing insights into what happens in the very early days with the baby and the, and the mother or the, whoever is the primary parent. He was kind of magical. Like he knew what little children were thinking and feeling in an incredible way. So it w you had even, did you get from the prose itself a sense of, of uh, connection that was deficient? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, I feel like I, I somehow reparented myself through Winnicott's ideas that I was getting from him the thing I hadn't gotten from my mother. That sounds so whiny. I, I, my mother was great. I'm fine, you know? What am I, why am I writing books about this? And no, it, well, it's talking about subjectivity. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's very legitimate to... to uh, um, but, but you were worried, nevertheless, that Helen would, your mother would read this as in some way the accusation of her inadequacy as a mother. And that was one of the great inhibitions of the, of yes. the process. But I needn't have worried because an, an early review came out and it referred to the distant but, oh, now I can't remember the word, distant but close. <laughs> How can that be? The distance, but distance, but um, something mm. relationship between my mother and me, and she, she thought that was great. She thought that was exactly spot on. It didn't bother her to have our relationship described as distant. Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense to her. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't. She didn't see the way I did Winnicott as a rival for you. I don't, honestly, I don't know what she saw. She didn't give me a lot of feedback on this book, except to say um, that it cohered. Um, so the good enough mother, Winnicott, one of the great things that's reassuring to a mother, if you read Winnicott, is that there's no such thing as a good mother. There's only a good enough mother. And that was a very famous insight. And... Uh, um, so he, but he then, the whole story of his life and his sexual, his personal, his, you, what you do is you weave everybody's stories, you're like the magpie, you weave everybody's personal stories somehow into this narrative, uh, including Virginia Woolf's with her mother, but, but so, but Winnicott's own st life as a man. Yes, this is what, after learning about his wonderful ideas, I learned more about him personally, and he, first I learned that he was kind of androgynous, or Faye, someone described him as, um, that he had these amazing powers with children, that he was impotent. Uh, he was married for many years to his first wife, and it was a celibate relationship. Um, it's not exactly sure why. She was a little dotty, as, as the biography said, and he had who knows what issues. But in his middle years, in his 40s, he met this other woman and fell in love with her. Claire Britton, when they were both working with um, kids who'd been evacuated from London during the Blitz, um, which was also really interesting because Winnicott would later say of the, these kids who got shipped away from their families that they would have been better off bombed than removed from their homes. Uh, so he and Claire were both, they never had children, he never had a kid, and, he, and Claire never got pregnant but they were taking care of these evacuated children. That's how they met. Uh, and then he started having an affair with her, and he had sex for the first time when he was, like, 48. And that, I just found that really cool. <laughs> Is know? it the coolness resides in the, the finality of it, as in a Victorian novel, or it resides in the, delayed, the sense of delayed gratification if you hold your, that your d deprivation will finally end? What, what's the it seems very brave to me. If you've gone that long without doing this thing, it seems like it would get really, in, really scary and problematic. And I guess it struck me as, as like really a, a great liberatory experiment that he 
took. It was inspiring. And then his, his actual work really took off, like after he began this relationship with Claire. And I like that link, too, between his physical, sexual life and this flowering of his ideas was very exciting. But, you know, I wasn't thinking of this. It's not in my copious, uh, very pretentious notes, that, that the notion of sort of heroic emotional daring, the, 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 the willingness to take a big emotional risk is completely woven into all of your, both of the memoirs and for yourself as the, and, and represents one of the great difficulties in writing them. Uh, I, I hope so. I'm, I'm glad you think so. I, I'm, I guess that's what I do. I, yeah, I'm like an emotional um, high wire act. <laughs> I felt like that's, in, in the case of this book about my mother, that that is what I was doing. Like just, okay, I'm going to do this, and I just have to start walking out here and see what happens. Well, yeah, fear is, fear is really, the, in a way, fear is the organizing principle in Are You My Mother in the form of the dreams that, that kind of structure. Is that going too far to say that fear is... No, no, you're right. I guess I don't know. I wasn't thinking of it so much that way. But yeah, the whole, the sort of backbone of the story about my mother, well, the story about my mother ends up rather solipsistically being the story of writing the book about my father. And it begins with me telling my mother that I'm going to write a memoir about my father and reveal these family secrets that he was gay and that he killed himself. Um, because that, it wasn't clear that it was a suicide, and that was a part of the story that I wanted to tell. So I knew that was going to be, she wasn't going to be happy about that. And, it, and I also knew that I really needed to tell this story. So I had to have this conf moment of confrontation with her when I told her that. And so that's when the book, I begin the book about her. But that, that moment was sort of preceded by a dream I had where I was trapped in a, in a basement full of spiders and I couldn't get out but then magically a door opened and I jumped into this beautiful brook and it was like somehow this creative energy was going to save me from the spidery place. And I pointed out to Allison when I visited her in her house that, that the space that she had drawn, you said really? was exactly like the space right outside your studio door, which is in, on a lower level, sort of in a basement. And there's a little window, and there's a little door. There are these two by fours. Um, I want to move into that studio for a minute, because I think, you know, I, I think you, you've sort of pioneered a new, besides being, the, the, the genre of graphic fiction and memoir is, uh, is very highly weighted, um, more, many, many more men, and it's very macho genre in some ways. And Allison is one of the sort of leading and few women pr practitioners of it. But you've also sort of pioneered a genre which combines show and tell in fourth grade with uh, James Joyce's portrait of the artist as a young gay woman. And so there's this high, low, popular and intellectual um, high wire act that's going on. And I don't think you can understand that unless you actually see the work and what goes into it, and the, 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 the literal and metaphorical layers. So if you could... Okay, I'll, I'll just, I'm going to just talk briefly about how I make the physical work. Um, one thing that really excites me about graphic narrative, well, cartooning, I don't need to call it anything fancy, is that you're, it's writing two-dimensionally and not one-dimensionally. Like regular prose, it is, is, it's one-dimensional. There's a line of text, and it flows from left to right across the page. And it really doesn't matter where any particular word falls. It just keeps going, and you turn the page, and it keeps going like a line. And when you're telling a graphic story, it, really, it matters very much where things fall on the page. You know, you use the page turns to surprise the reader. Um, you, you have to lay stuff out in a way that makes sense. And so I write in a drawing program. Um, here's uh, l just a little sample of what that looks like. I have this little template with the blue lines that I can reshape my panels in any number of different configurations. And here I'm making them into like three little panels over one big panel. But I can break up the page in all different kinds of ways really quickly. And then I just start writing. Um, 
anywhere on the page. So instead of just uh, being in a word processing program, I'm placing this sentence deliberately here, and then I can, I can stretch it. Like I decided that this really is, would work better as a wide panel than a narrow panel, so I can just drag it out and reshape everything. Uh, and you write the text first. You don't. Well, I, I am writing, but I am also kind of drawing, too, because I know what's going to be in these panels. I'm not necessarily making the drawing, because that's very laborious, and I'm not certain what's going to be there, but I think I know. So I think of this as a kind of drawing. Um, it's very concise writing. I, I have to always be aware of the space. Like, this sentence would have been fine in prose, but I'm making it just a little shorter, so I have an eighth of an inch more for the drawing. And sometimes I do sketches. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm placing a sketch that I drew and scanned into Photoshop for this panel. And then I can, that's the drawing you saw before of my mother with a little fetus. And I just fit it in there. And so when I get a page written and designed in Illustrator like this, I, I then place it in a page layout program in InDesign where I can sort of get a sense of how the story is coming together as a larger structure. But also, I mean, what, what struck me when I first saw this in your studio is that it's, you know, everything is, the, the, the notion of home, which is central to what you do, uh, the, the big rambling house where you grew up, and then um, this is so much, it, it's so house-like, this structure. It's not unique to you in the sense that graphic work is structured this way, but the, the, the horizontal structure of the rooms, and you enter them vertically, and, and it's, it's very house-like. Yes, as you will see when you read Chris Ware's amazing building stories that is just coming out. He's always talking about the architecture, the way comics and architecture are similar. So I, I get that page printed out, and I just start drawing on it, really rough sketches. Um, I use photographs, snapshots to refine those drawings, make them a little more tidy and realistic. I get a final nice, neat pencil sketch. I ink that, scan it into Photoshop, and clean it all up. Color it. But there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of layers of of washes and inking and, and back and forth through the light yes. box and the printer. It's, it's pretty painstaking and tedious. Here, I do the shading on a separate layer of watercolor paper, scan that into Photoshop, and then combine all of these layers and then add the text like that. Um, I moved that posing. I want to get to that. That's okay. Don't don't do that yet. No, I want because I want there's a there's a real tension also between the language in the bubbles, which is uh, ordinary speech and all of its vulgarity and its its just directness and its the American idiom and the very sort of literary conception that organizes this book and that's part of the tension too, it seems to me. But and that was that must have been very difficult to come by. I mean, integrate. Or maybe it's not integrated. Maybe it's just sort of juxtaposed. Well, it was, it was something I had to let myself do. Because for many years, I was doing this comic strip, which was all dialogue and jokes and, you know, everyday funny kind of stuff. But as I started writing the book about my dad, I realized that I wanted to say more complicated things. And eventually, I had to acknowledge that I, I, I had, like, some literary ambition for this book. And I... It was hard to trust that I could do that, you know, that I could write with a different kind of diction. But um, eventually I, I let myself do it, and I just kept doing it. But yes, I, I feel like that there is a tension between the everydayness of the scenes and then the, the narration is a little more... The meta-text. Yes. And in fact, Fun Home is... Are You My Mother is organized according to the dream principle, but Fun Home is the books that you, the, the great classics of 20th century literature that your father loved. Isn't yes, it? yes. I work books into my comics a lot in a way that is kind of weird. <laughs> like, I'll just make a panel into text, like a quotation from another book, 
Um, but you never scan it in. You hand. No, this is all. Yeah, it's hand done in this crazy way. I think I have a little film of me doing the lettering. But both of the books are very much about books and writing. Oh, there. This oh, is good. what it's Let's, like. Yes, this is good. Um, Ironically, Allison I is not available to do your wedding invitation. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of funny because I don't actually hand letter my own narration or, and, or dialogue in the book. That's all digital, like you saw me typing with that font, which is a font made from my handwriting. But I do hand letter all the texts that I illustrate the book with, like this whole newspaper clipping and a that's all hand lettered. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> Can I just say something about handwriting? Please. Well, so these two big figures in the book about my mother were Donald Winnicott and Virginia Woolf. And after a long time of writing the book, I realized I hadn't seen their handwriting really, and I felt like that was really a big gap. Like I needed to know somehow what what their handwriting looked like. So I went to the Winnicott to some archives and I found, looked through a lot of his papers. I didn't find anything that interesting, but there were some drawings which I thought was really fun. Uh, this is a, a diagram that he once made of the, of the transitional object. And I worked that into my book. You just say what the transitional object is. Oh, the transitional object. That's like your teddy bear, the thing that children use to um, learn, learn to separate from their mother. This is Winnicott's big he also claim to fame. Yeah. He came up with that. Did you have one? No, my mother says none of us had them, which is interesting. I think that's, I'm not sure if that's good or bad. It sounds kind of bad. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's, that's Arnold Schwarzenegger's old bar belt now. <laughs> this is Virginia Woolf's um, outline of To the Lighthouse when she was starting to first think of it. She knew that it was going to be this shape. This was the structure of it. And so I, I loved that she had this little diagram. So I, I copied that in my book, like two blocks joined by a corridor. Were those two houses or two? What did they represent? Well, it's like the first, you know, into the lighthouse, there's these two big, long sections. The first one is a day, you know, before the war. The second one is a day after the war. And then between them is this magical sort of poetic passage where time, you know, 20 years are compressed into, anyhow, she had this image, which I think is so eloquent, before she even wrote anything. And then I, I got interested in her handwriting and her, the way her manuscript looked. And I, this is a page from To the Lighthouse, which I, I then painstakingly copied. That was a really fun exercise, because I had to not only copy her handwriting, but copy her crossings out and her, all her own edits. It was really interesting. I want to come back to that in a second because uh, it, 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 it um, goes into the next question. But, but nothing at all, I mean, this is like the great labor of these memoirs, that nothing is gratuitous and much time is spent in editing out the superfluity of details. So Virginia Woolf is not just in there because Alison happens to admire her. She was intimately related, and maybe you could say how to... Well, I became very fascinated by this passage in one of her, Virginia Woolf's memoir pieces about how she, it was in writing to the lighthouse that she got her mother out of her head, that she'd always been obsessed with her mother, like felt her watching her, judging her. But after writing this semi-autobiographical book about her childhood, she was freed of that, of that mother in her head. And I thought, I want to do that. And there's a fantastic passage in which, she, which you reproduce by hand in, in, in the book, in which she, she, she describes the elation of having laid her ghost in front of Yeah, her. yeah. Um, well, the, the notion which I also never thought of before uh, is that in copying someone's handwriting, it's a kind of act of impersonation. It's putting yourself into their skin, into their flesh. It's... it's it's imitating their gestures or trying to, yeah. and then, but you did this in a much more corporal, visceral, you know, physical way with when you were preparing. Yeah, them. okay. Uh, she's talking about this, this my crazy um, posing process. I, when I'm doing my drawings, I, this started just as a drawing aid. I would pose very quickly in the 
position that my character was in. I, I used to do this in the old days, like by looking in the mirror, or I had a Polaroid that I would use for really tricky poses, but I was very sparing with it because it cost a dollar for every like Polaroid shot that you took. But then along came digital photography, and I could take endless pictures, and now I do. I pose for pretty much all the characters in my stories. Let's see, that's me as my mother walking in the room there. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's Allison's cat. Oh, here. <laughs> uh, the cat's called Donald. And it's a, it's a funny process. Yeah, the She's cat's named um, Donald Winnicott. Uh, <laughs> I use a lot of aerial shots in the in this book about my mother, which entailed a lot of running up and downstairs from my loft while I would stage these pictures. Um, sometimes it's like <clears throat> very athletic. These were. <laughs> wait, so, wait, no, no, go back. That's too great. Go back. Yeah. What? No, 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 no get the two, the, the drawing and, and you. We can only see one at a time. Oh, they were both on the same. Oh, no, I see. we, we oh, see something I different than different. what okay. they see. <laughs> but that was a pose for this. Yes. And here I am posing as um, <laughs> Donald Winnicott for this scene. Here, he, he, this is this is Winnicott working with a, a a little girl, famous patient called the Piggle. Where'd you get the suit? Did you have that suit? I had that suit. I got that suit when I was in college. I actually graduated from college in that suit. That's in those days, that was very daring. Very daring. Um, and I only did it because my mother didn't come to my graduation. There was no one there to watch me, so I figured, what the hell, I'm going to wear my suit. Um, but but a little aside here, and I'm going to try to, yeah, this is, no, that. So you spent a lot of time posing as your mother. Yes. I spent a lot of time posing as myself, even. Right. That's true. But yes. Um, and did it change, did you ever have, which is interesting because your mother is an actress and she spent a lot of time posing as other people and it, there's this sort of, these layers of, of posing as well and of um, acting is mysterious to me, I don't know how you get into or out of, you know, someone else's character, but did, did you, did this lead to an em empathetic impersonation for you? I feel like it did. That wasn't my intention going in. It was really just a drawing aid. But as I found myself, you know, acting out something my mother was doing, it was weird, like to think of being in her body looking out through her eyes. And it did give me a, a kind of insight into, into these various people I was writing about that I don't think I would have had. And I realized I was, I probably learned something about acting from my mother, that somehow I knew some of these I somehow osmosed this from, from her, watching her acting. You, you look like you're having fun when you're dressing up, and, but, but I don't know. I mean, I know how tortured the rest of the process was, so was it? Was it? It's funny. I, I was showing these somewhere else recently, and they said, oh, that looks like so much fun, like you're playing. And I was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, suffering. Can't you see how I'm suffering? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it is kind of cool. I get to do some really fun stuff. I guess I don't, you know, I'm very absorbed in it in the moment, so I don't really think of it as fun, but... It's clinging from a cliff, uh, rolling around on your office floor. It's, it's really fun. No, it's, it sounds like fun. <laughs> um, but actually, you're, there's going to be a musical of Fun Home. Yes. So Did you know that? Someone will be playing, <laughs> soon be impersonating Allison. Yeah. Uh, it's really amazing. It's at the public theater. It will, it will, the real play won't, will be opening next mm. fall, but right now it, they're having a workshop. Uh, it opens like next week, I think. Um, and it's my family and me, like singing. <laughs> it's, and it's really good. Like when I first heard about this thing being turned into a musical, I thought that was crazy. Like how could you possibly do that? But it's actually amazing. Um, Lisa Crone has written the script and Janine Tesori is doing the music and they had, have been collaborating very closely and now Sam Gold is directing it and it's really cool. Did you feel, I mean, did you sort of feel a displacement when you, because I, I know I went with you to an early, early yeah. reading and here's, you were taking, you were in some ways appropriating your parents' experience. They are in some ways appropriating yours. I know, I got a taste of my own medicine. 
you know, I, I, I know, my, you know, my family is not really thrilled that I write about them, and now I see why. It's very odd to, I mean, they took my they, story, they, they handled it very respectfully, but still, it's weird to see someone take your the material of your life and translate it. Yeah, translate it, put it out there in public. Uh, you know, there's an Allison character. There's there's actually three Allison characters: a little girl, a college-age me, and a middle-aged me. It's very odd. Mm. But uh, they have they cast those the characters yet? Well, they have people they're working with now. Okay. I, I want to go back to the fabulous sort of Dior um looking suit that Allison, the Winnicott suit that Allison <laughs> uh, wore to her um, graduation because, y you know, and this is one of these great ironies of, of Fun Home that your father is a very closeted gay man who was obsessed with decorating and obsessed with antique furniture, w was determined to dress you in the girliest of girly yes. uh, ways. And yes, we had very, very bizarre gender dynamics in my family, as you can see kind of illustrated here. <clears throat> um. Yeah, I was always having these terrible battles with my father. Um. Including decorating battles, he wanted to put flowered wallpaper. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, we had a really terrible f fight one night over w whether or not I would wear pearls to go out to dinner with this turtleneck. <laughs> there was an, it's funny here, but it was, a, it was an awful fight. And I refused to wear them, and he was really, really angry with me. We had a terrible evening at dinner. Everyone's scowling. So he, it was a form of you know, his, his sexual identity or his gender orientation had been denied and he was going to goddamn deny yours. Did he, you do feel he knew that you were? I don't, I don't, I thought he, he I knew thought what he, he told might him, have. I mean, you know, especially when he handed me a, a volume of Colette when I was 19, I wondered if that was the message. Um, but he claims he didn't really know. He, in this amazing, like, one conversation we had about it when I sort of confronted him. You know, it's, it's funny, some people recently have told me that they feel like Fun Home is a, is a transgender story. What, explain that, I don't get that. Well, because of this stuff, oh. because my, my dad saying he wished he was a girl and me, me talking about, you know, dressing up in boys' clothes. Uh, I mean, I'm a total transvestite. Um, <laughs> Well, I guess, no, someone just said her ex-lover gave Fun Home to his mother to explain the fact that he was going to be transitioning from female to male. And I just thought that was funny because I don't think of it necessarily as, as a transgender story. Like, but I was equating my dad's homosexuality and, and mine with, with a kind of, well, I talk about that, that old-fashioned concept of the Invert, um, mm. the Proustian, the, yeah, the verb, yeah. the, the noun that Proust is Proust translators. And like Proust. when I was younger, that's kind of how I made sense of my own lesbianism. Inversion. Like, yeah, like um, like kind of a boy in a girl's body. And now I know it's not that at all. But I think my father and I both had a kind of similar understanding of that. Um, but it, it's another sort of related fact is that when you started cartooning in a serious way, you were just out of college or in college, and you told me that you never drew women, which I, is yeah. really striking, and uh, you drew muscle men. Yes. Yeah. Um, all during my childhood, I only drew boys and men. And, I, you know, for a long time, I explained that as, oh, they were doing the interesting things that I wanted to do, like chopping down trees and playing baseball. And I didn't want to draw women. You know, it, it was the 60s. Everything was so stereotype. But I do think there was some kind of gender dysphoria going on. Well, we, we talked about it. It's funny because we, you said that, that in some way these were the men your father had, your father had admired beautiful men. And, and so you were, that's what you were, 
in some ways in drawing men you were looking at the world you were looking at this, this sort of sexual world in a way through his eyes I don't know if that if that is so maybe I said that maybe you didn't say that but I like that but I have I have something else to say about that okay I feel like what was going on in my family <clears throat> was I, I I did dress like a boy I still dress like a boy and well, what I learned from Winnicott, let me just show this panel yeah. of Winnicott. Um, uh, this is just something ref illustrating Winnicott's own androgyny. Um, he had this amazing way of thinking about gender and sexual orientation that was really way ahead of its time. Um, he understood that they weren't linked that you could he, there's an amazing essay he wrote called the origins of creativity where he's analyzing a heterosexual 50 year old man who's unhappy for various reasons but all of a sudden Winnicott looks at the guy and says when I look at you I see a little girl and the guy just like broke down sobbing when I read this I broke down sobbing he his mother had wanted a girl and for, you know for the first few months of his life he'd been handled as a as a girl and somehow that was imprinted on him and he just never felt like he was himself and then Winnicott like freed him but so it's the glance of the other it's the reflection of the other that frees you from the prison of not being seen in so many places in these in your memoirs right. that's good yeah. <laughs> but I feel like it basically wasn't it was safest for me in my family to kind of be a boy it wasn't why is that well, I think, I don't know, I mean, here's my mother married to a gay man and in this not really intimate, loving relationship. My father, both of them, like, loved boys, you know? Both of them were attracted to men. And so, in some way, I was picking up on that. Like, I wanted to be what they wanted, I think. Mm -hmm. Even though they both explicitly wanted me to be a girl and look more like a girl, somehow psychically I knew that I would survive better if I were not a girl. And I think that served me pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, but at some point, both for political reasons, it was the 70s, you, you studied martial arts at an all-female dojo and you started drawing women and you started, that's where the dyke, the dykes came out of that. Yeah, so, yeah, being all caught up in lesbian feminism made me feel like, why am I drawing guys? This is crazy. And so I forced myself to draw women. And at first I could only draw women if I knew they were lesbians. <laughs> and then I got a little more fluent and flexible. But that's kind of how Dykes to Watch Out For started, these like exercises in drawing women. And it, it's, it's funny because I sort of, the search for the, this normality, and then there's the alternate normality, alternative normality of the world of the Dykes. And your parents were in the Fun Home. It was, we should say, for those of you who haven't read it, Fun Home stands for Funeral Home. We missed this bit because the Bechtel family had, for several generations, owned and run a funeral home in um, the small town, Beaver Creek. Yes. Beaver Creek. Uh, but um, so the, there was this. There was this sort of prison of normality that 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 every everyone was in denial that it wasn't normal that in fact nobody in the in that house was normal <laughs> yes that's true um, so the the world of dykes was it's what's funny about it is that it's uh, in a way it's sort of the sitcom of lesbian life in 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 a city like Minneapolis and everybody has the same concern that there's it, it both abolishes and establishes the difference. That's yeah, really yeah. It was a way for me to both be normal, but to celebrate my own queerness and all the, you know, just to accept queerness as the ground and go from there. Um, <clears throat> there's uh, th this. This is a sort of the arduous process of getting. Uh, to through the door and into the pool and um, to a kind of place of freedom. Do you feel, having come through 
both of these books that you have reached the place of freedom? Is it is it ephemeral? The sense of the the sense of release? Because I want to come back to the end of both books in a second. I I definitely felt a kind of freedom and release after writing the book about my dad. Um, and I hoped that I would have that same feeling after writing about my mother, but it somehow hasn't happened. Um, and maybe that's just because, you know, books keep moving after you've finished them. Like, I don't know if I felt that release immediately after I wrote Fun Home, it, but once it's out in the world and I go around talking about it and people respond to it and my family deals with it um, and reacts to it, maybe all of that was part of feeling the release. And the, and the book about my mother is still like molten. It's still happening and uh, I don't know. You still talk, you're still too close. Yes. Uh, but I guess the, the notion of reunion, I mean, the Winnicott's, um, the, there's, in both cases, at the end of both memoirs, there's an there's a incredibly powerful last scene that it's, the, the subtitle of Fun Home is a tragic comedy. Tragic comic. A tragic comic, <laughs> sorry. A little pun. And, <laughs> and then the, the subtitle of Are You My Mother is... A comic drama. A comic drama. And, and yet at the end, the, the, it's resolved in sort of scenes of forgiveness on both sides and transcendence on both sides. And, uh, yes. Shall I yeah, show this one? Yeah, so let's talk about this. Um, this is the, the very ending of Fun Home. I don't know if you, oh, you can probably read I that. I can see it, yeah. Um, but what I realized as I was working on this book about my father for many years, it took a long time to do, was that he had taught me to be the artist who was making this book, who was able to write this stuff down and, and draw these pictures. And so the, the ending of the book for me was this sort of uh, acknowledgement of that. Like I'm, I'm jumping into the pool in this childhood scene that really happened, but really it's this mythic embrace of my, well, I'm, I'm drawing all these parallels to a portrait of the artist in Ulysses, and my father is Daedalus, and, um, you know, the, the artificer, the mad scientist, and he taught me to do this stuff, so it's, a, it's an acknowledgement of, of that. And weirdly, I mean, not, or not weirdly at all, it's, this, <laughs> this, it's the same story with my mother. This is the final image of the book about my mother. It's actually, there should be a gutter down the middle of that. So you read the stuff on the left first, and then you read the right-hand side. Um, but in the case of this story, too, I feel like my mother taught me to write. Uh, this is a, I, we were playing this, this game that she would play with me called the crippled child game, where I would <laughs> pretend I was crippled. <laughs> and she would indulge me and, like, give, give me pretend crutches and braces and things. But this was also another really rare case of her being uh, playful and entering into your imaginative Yes, th and this is the moment when I feel like I became a writer, when my mother would indulge these fantasies and I realized you could do that. She didn't try to say, oh, why do you want to be crippled? Or, you know, you shouldn't do that. She totally went there with me and it was this intoxicating feeling of, oh my God, you can just imagine whatever you want. And she gave that to me. And while I also feel like she kind of threw me overboard in some ways, like, you know, using me narcissistically or whatever. And she, not refusing to touch you. Well, yeah, and that too. But then she threw me this amazing life preserver of you can write your way out of this. So that's what that's about. And this is the, is this the, because I, I can. Is that the, that's the crippled child game? Yes. She would hand you the crutch and pretend to lace up your special shoes. Yes. Um, did you, she was, but in a way she was, she was much more nurturing towards your, the, this game of helplessness than she was towards the fierce independence that, and that, the autonomy, the notion of autonomy, and yet 
Uh, I never thought of it that way. Um, we just kind of went our own ways. I mean, I think she liked me being autonomous. Mm -hmm. She preferred it that way. Um, we're going to uh, have questions. I'm gonna, I know you have a lot of questions, a little more time. Um, wait, wait, one second. I just want to know what, I know there's, right now there's the, 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 the musical and uh, you're still sort of doing book speaking and, and this and that and you taught at Chicago and you were the judge of America's Best Comics and things like that. Do you know what you want to write next? I sort of do, but it's so tenuous. You don't want to say I can't even, I can barely even think about it. I can't talk about it. Um, it's not going to be about my family, though. My mother wants me to give the old family thing a rest. <laughs> I, I know, I, sh I shouldn't listen to her, but I'm going to. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will keep writing about my family, though. I'm just, I'm going to let things gestate. And we, we talked about the notion of doing a graphic biography. Oh, yeah, I thought that might be cool sometime, to do a biography of someone, someone else. That would be very relaxing. <laughs> Wait till you try. Um, but, uh, and who would you, who, have you ever thought of doing a biography? Well, you've done a biography of Winnicott, but who, who would be, what kind of subject would appeal to you to do? Uh, I don't know, I started with thinking of Rachel Carson, hmm. Adrienne Rich, maybe? That would be a lot of work. I don't know. Hmm. Uh, oh, oh, the James family. The James family, all together? Yeah. Actually, actually, I shouldn't talk about that because I might actually do that. I think okay. that'll be like when I do write my third family memoir, I might use the Jameses as a little template. Um, that would be staggering and, and wonderful. Uh, and I think James would probably, uh, Alice would really like it. Yeah, poor Alice. Yeah, poor Alice. And they had two other brothers, Alice, Henry, William, and then two other brothers who Wilkie. no one ever heard of. One of them was killed in the Civil War, I believe, or, or badly. I think he just got wounded, and then oh, he, he got, got became an alcoholic and died, and they had wretched lives. Yes, they did. Um, well, I, I uh, did want to end this on the transcendent note of liberation, uh, both uh, in both cases from um, the bonds of love and of non-love, and of recognition and non-recognition. Um, and I wanted to say thank you to Allison, and uh, to say a, a distant thank you to Helen, <laughs> and to thank Donald Winnicott, and to thank you for being a really good audience who laughed at my very few <laughs> attempts at jokes. And, uh, and good night, Moon. And um, we should take questions, and I hope you will uh, come and ask. Come and ask. Yeah, we have little microphones here. People There's have some stuff microphones. They want to so ask. if you line up, and and unlike my questions, if you could be as succinct as possible so that people get a chance to, to talk, that would be great. But thank you. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. You made it first to the mic. Um, okay, you can hear me. Uh, hi. Um, Thanks for this. I really enjoyed it. I'm a big fan of Fun, fun Home. I just think it's amazing. Um, Thank you. I, uh, I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm going to have to try to formulate this as a question, but I'm thinking about the relationship of the graphic novel to the novel, or the graphic memoir to the memoir, and um, so one with images and one without. I'm just thinking about how literacy, especially for younger people these days, has become so much more about the interaction of the image with text. Yeah. And I'm wondering if what you think about sort of the future of literacy and education and that sort of thing in relation to the graphic novel because I find that there's some really interesting directions that all this could go, you know, educationally. I'm not sure what that means for the future of the non-image based <laughs> books. Well, I feel like, yeah, we're kind of as a culture becoming more visually literate. I'll put it that way instead of saying less verbally literate, but <laughs> I think it's just shifting. And I, I used to say more cynically that that's why I drew graphic novels, because pretty soon that's all people were going to read. But I don't think that's true. I think, you know, the way we read is really changing, especially with, you know, the internet. And 
and visual stuff can communicate things that are just as dense and rich and subjective as, as writing, I think. You know, I'm, that's something, that's a project I'm very interested in exploring. That's what I, you know, comics has traditionally been very action oriented, something you see from the outside, but I, I want to push on how much of our interior experience you can capture in comics. That's really good. Hi. Um, I've only uh, read Fun Home. Uh, I haven't read the new one about your mother. I'm, and uh, in that you ended sort of as a college student, and I just wondered how you got into comics or graphic novels, and, and how you came to know that that's, that was your route. I um, wanted to be a cartoonist as a little kid. I would read The New Yorker. And I would see those amazing cartoons. Before I even knew how to read, I, would, I knew to go to the talk of the town, and then there would be the funny pictures. And then eventually I learned to read the captions, and they still didn't make any sense. <laughs> um, but what I especially loved were the, the analyst cartoons. I thought that was so cool. Like, the notion that someone would just like sit and listen to another person was fascinating to me. And I, I wanted to be either a psychiatrist or a cartoonist as a kid. <laughs> And you became both. You, do, you made a new profession. Well, I wrote a cartoon book about psychoanalysis. Right. Um, but I, even though I wanted that as a child, I, I abandoned it as I went through school because everyone said, you can't be a cartoonist. You know, there's like three cartoonists, and they're, even if they die, their comic strips are going to continue, so don't even bother. <laughs> so I decided I would become something more practical, like a graphic designer or a book designer. But then I got out of college and I didn't get into graduate school and I just started drawing comics for fun for uh, a feminist monthly here in New York called Woman News. Just started drawing these cartoons and I realized, oh, I can do this. Even though I wasn't getting paid, I was becoming a cartoonist and I just kept doing that. And eventually I got paid for it. Thank you. That was my little uh, thumbnail cartoonist bio. This little speak closer into the well, mic, thanks. Okay. Um, I just want to say that I absolutely love the book, Are You My Mother? I oh, read thank it this you. Summer. I'm passionate about it. It just has so much meaning for me. I, it's just incredible. Thank you. Um, and so I have two questions. Maybe they're large questions, and I just, you know, answer them or not. I, I just was curious how you found a way to the real story you wanted to tell from the story that you started with, which was, was sort of abstract about the self and the other, and then you, how you, what that process was like. Because um, I, I want to say that your story gave me a lot of courage and helped me feel like I could speak out and reveal myself. So I'm very grateful for that. And the other question is, um, how did you select from what must have been mountains of ideas and quotes from Virginia Woolf and Donald Winnicott to uh, decide what to put in your book? And did you decide on the quotes first or the story and then find quotes that went with the story? Or what was that process? Oh, those are big questions. I know. So, <laughs> you know, you don't, whatever. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take the first one first, which is how did I eventually get this to the story I told, as opposed to the story I was avoiding. Um, it was remembering this period, this very intense batch of dreams that I had when I was writing Fun Home. I, and I keep a diary, and I had written down lots of information about these dreams. And as I was writing the book about my mother, I found these dreams, and I realized, oh my god, these dreams are amazing, and they tell a story. They tell a story of me like having this kind of titanic confrontation with my mother, like this, this psychic battle. <laughs> and they were these very intense dreams that happened over a period of a couple months about that while I was writing, while I was, while I was preparing to show her the drafts of Fun Home, while I was waiting for her response, while I was dealing with her response. And these dreams told a story of like standing up to her and, and surviving. And, so I use the dreams. I know you're not supposed to tell people your dreams, or certainly, God forbid, write about them in books, but I did. I started each chapter with one of these dreams that happened in a chronological order over a brief period of time. 
And none of the rest of the book is chronological at all. It goes all over the place. But these dreams are little anchors in time and follow this psychic, this story of transformation, I think. Um, that's the answer to that. I, I, just, I just wanted to add something here because it was an interesting question. That, that the notion that you're not supposed to tell people your dreams, you're certainly not supposed to take them into your therapy sessions and go on and on about what your shrink says. You, you, that is you, you sort of almost in a perversely defiant way. It's one of the taboos that you break, one of many, many taboos that you decided you're going to break in these books, in all of them. I mean, there are scenes of masturbation, there are scenes of oral sex, there are scenes of on the toilet with your pants on, there's <laughs> scenes in your therapist's <laughs> office telling her, you know, and, 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 and. <laughs> so is that kind of a strategy on your part, a conscious um, strategy because there's partly the strategy it's like I want you to trust me and how can you trust me if you if I'm not showing you everything but it's also it just I come from this underground comics tradition where that was de rigueur everyone had a masturbation scene in their comics you know <laughs> uh, you know I, I would read R. Crumb and Aileen Kaminsky Crumb's work and Harvey P. Carr and it's all about real gritty life and so I just kind of also tried to do that mm -hmm. That's but, why. Right. The, 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 I guess it's on the other side. I try not to think about those masturbation scenes. <laughs> oh, we, won't, we won't bring it up again. Yes. Oh, hi. I love both the books so much. I, I think they're both so beautiful. Um, I'm really curious about the choice of the accent colors um, because I, in the second book, I found the red very jarring, especially compared to that kind of gentle tealish color that you used in Fun Home, and you know, maybe almost room like. And I was wondering if there's some kind of re reason that you chose this. Um, kind of arresting color to pair with your mother? There, it's not a very interesting answer, and I'm, I'm not really delighted with the way the color actually looks, but I won't bore you with all those technical things. Um, I wanted the book to, I wanted the mother book to look different from Fun Home, so I had to pick a different color, and surprisingly, there's not really that many options if you're doing, using color in a naturalistic way. I couldn't use like purple or yellow or orange, so there's not a lot left besides red. And I, so I picked a kind of brownish red. I don't know. It seemed sort of like blood, like this symbolic of this connection to my mother. So that's why I picked it. But I'm not thrilled with how it actually looks on the page. Hi. Uh, thanks Hi. very much for your work. Oh. Um, I was wondering about what you said at the beginning of the conversation where you said that you wanted to set the record straight um, that Are You My Mother would have been a different book if you knew that your mother had not read it. And, but then you also said that you know you won't want us to trust you and uh, believe that you're sharing uh, with us everything. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak to uh, the role of truth-telling in memoirs and um, maybe elaborate on um, how you reconcile your your desire to maintain personal relationships with your creative impulses? Oh, that's good. Um, <laughs> I mean, part of my plight is, my plight or my, my, my good fortune is that I grew up in a family that was really kind of remote. And I feel like, yes, my mother's not thrilled that I'm doing this, but she, she tolerates it in an amazing way that I think a lot of families wouldn't. Like, she has not cut me off in any way, you know, because I'm doing this. Um, and it's because of this distance. Like, she doesn't really care <laughs> in a way, I guess, or I don't care. Wait, she wrote me a letter after the profile was published and said how proud she was of you. She did? Yeah. <laughs> you might have even told me that, but I can never let it in. <laughs> That's kind of staggering. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I feel very, very committed to being as accurate as I can. I don't like memoirs that sort of s smooth things over, or do a lot of compression and stuff. I try to use actual documents, you know, diary entries and n newspaper articles and stuff to really get at what actually happened. That's really important to me. But, of course, I'm making things up. Like, I don't remember conversations I had with my mother when I was three, I had to make that up. Um, but I, and it's a slippery slope. I can say, well, it felt like the truth of what happened. But of course, you can say that about 
about anything you like. But you just have to trust me. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Uh, you talked a lot about Winnicott's good enough mother theory. And I was wondering if in studying Winnicott and being a daughter, you developed a theory of the good enough daughter. <laughs> good question. I guess, yeah. That, I like that. I guess I am a good enough daughter. Um, I think that probably goes for anything anyone does, any capacity. We, all, all we can do is what we can do, that, and that aiming for perfection or some abstract, you know, level of goodness is just going to be torture. Um, I'm going to, it makes me feel better to think that I'm a good enough daughter. I'm going to keep saying that. C can, you, can you think that you're a good enough artist? Oh, God, no. <laughs> no. No, that doesn't work. No. Can you? No. Oh. Uh, so, well, no, the, the, well, this is the great conflict between the perfectionism and the, the, the perfectionism, and somehow you, you believe that if you're ever satisfied with what you do, that's, the, that's sort of like you've bitten the bullet. Yeah, yes. Kiss of death. Right. Uh, yeah, you can't ever be complacent. You must always be miserable. Yeah. Judith and I have bonded around this a lot. Oh, yeah, that's why we were both. We, I mean, in fact, what, what you saw was a complete derailment of any plan that we might have had because Allison did the slides and then I did the questions and we tried to put them together and we didn't have enough time. And we were both intent on making this beautiful structure of questions and images. And it, it, we, we were humbled by <laughs> the, the liveness of the, of the moment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for two more questions, I think, yes. I'd like to start my question with a brief shout out to Dykes to watch out for. Thank you. <laughs> what I'm sorry to hear that? With Dykes to watch out for. A shout out. Oh, shout out to, to Dykes. Dykes, great. To watch out for. Uh, so many of us have read the second book, two books, the following books, and I just want to recommend Dykes to watch out for for anyone Thank you. in the audience who has not had the pleasure. Um, I guess I would just say that there's not a week that goes by that I don't think of something that happens or a character in Dykes Watch Out For. Oh, that's and very my sweet. And I <laughs> recite it from memory <laughs> often. In fact, there have been times that we'll tell a story that something happened to us, and then the other person will turn to them and say, that didn't happen to you. That happened in Dykes Watch Out For. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess my question is, the spirit of Dykes Watch Out For and the spirit of the characters in Dykes Watch Out For have been so foundational to me, and I think they were foundational to LGBT literature in this century, um, and I'm wondering whether this, the spirit of those characters lives on and possibly in future work. I Not that this, these books don't have the spirit, but I I don't know. I often think, am I if I get all this family stuff out of my system, can I turn back to fiction? You know, although I don't even really think of Dykes Watch Out for as fiction. Somehow I felt like. It was, I don't know, some form of journalism or channeling. <laughs> um, but anthropology. I don't, anthropology, definitely. Um, I don't know. I, it's a good question, and I'm very touched that you think about the characters and stuff. And I guess, I guess I'll see. In fact, at a reading I was at last year, high schoolers were quoting it in a way wow. that I quote it to my friends. And I was like, whoa, this is like, it spans generations. Wow. That's, can, I can you, say, you really as a member of this generation say this? Can you define that foundational quality, or can you say what it is Maybe that you... Maybe it was you're... the time I was reading it, when I was, what I was doing in my life. I'm, you know, for me, it, the characters wrestle personally with things, and then they also are thinking about the queer theory they're reading, and they're kind of making fun of it, but they're also applying it to their lives. Thank you. Thank you. So my question actually relates can you just talk a little bit, thanks, a little bit louder? My question relates in a way to the first question, um, which has had to do with graphic novels. Um, I teach literacy to kids with learning disabilities, and a lot of the texts that we give them are graphic novels because they don't have a lot of access to language, and they can visualize great literature in a way that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. Uh -huh. um, and I guess I, the question I had for you is, do you see yourself, in a sense, giving literature to people who don't have a lot of access to language or who have mm. access to language in a different way? It's a really good question. 
I, I've heard from a lot of people who, who work with kids with ver various kinds of learning disabilities that picture stories are just more accessible, and I, I love that idea. Um, I, I like to think that I, you know, I'm drawing these comics that happen on many different levels, like there's an accessible scene unfolding on one level, and then there's other more complicated stuff in the text, and you can take from it what you like. like Hopefully it works on these on different levels, and so I, I love the idea that people could look at the pictures and respond to those. I mean, I know like I like reading comics in languages I don't understand because I can still figure them out, kind of. So it's probably kind of like that. Yeah. Um, but that's great. Thank you for for that work that you're doing. I, I think I was supposed to say something about Twitter, which is that if you. <laughs> want to Twitter or tweet about this, uh, the ha please use the hag tash. <laughs> <laughs> N-Y-E-R fest. Is that right? N-Y-E-R fest, yeah. Right, F-E-S-T. Uh, it's I, too late now. The Twitter verse has moved on. <laughs> I've been asked to uh, let everybody know that there was an iPhone found at the DGA theater for an earlier event today. And if you have lost one, please see the house manager. Just call the last incoming phone call. It was her mother. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> Thank you very Thanks much, Alice. Thank you, Judith.